this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and it's finally here, the Sony VAIO Duo 13. It's a Windows 8 full Intel Core i Haswell machine, one of the few Haswell machines on the market, 13.3 inches. It's not just a tablet, though. It has a slider, like so, and we're going to look at it now. Hey, finally, the Duo 13. Here it is. I know a lot of you have been wanting this video review, and really, it is a lovely machine. You know we like the Duo 11 quite a lot. There was certainly room for improvement, but Sony was one of the first to come up with a Windows 8 convertible machine, and it was a pretty neat piece of hardware. Well, they've done a lot to, to change and make things better here without making it much bigger and heavier. That's the amazing thing. The, the Duo 11, which is 11.6 inch, was about 2.86 pounds. This one's 13.3 inches and it's 2.93 pounds, so hardly any heavier. And the footprint isn't much bigger either, which is nice too, because when you're using something that acts like a tablet, you, you want to not have it be too bulky. Obviously, we have a keyboard over here. Big display, full HD triluminous display, 1920 by 1080. We'll talk about that in greater detail. It is available in your choice of what they call white, which is this one here, which really is a silver body, just the white surrounder on the screen, or carbon black. And like the Sony Pro 13 that we reviewed, this is carbon fiber, but there's less flex in it. So those of you who are freaked out by that flex that's inherent to carbon fiber and it helps it bend without breaking, well, you're not going to have so much of it here. This guy is a stiffer model because by Sony standards, they actually have a lot more space to work with here because this guy is thicker and heavier than the really wafish Vio Pro line. If we take a look at the side, cleaner look already. Instead of that kind of steampunk design we had with the Duo 11 with the big flap that was trying to hide a whole lot of wires, much more simplified kind of thing going on there. There's little, little hooks that the screen kind of latches into to keep it stable, and it is very stable here. You have to give a little extra push to make sure it locates into those little hooks right there. Not too much of a biggie, but as we lift it up, you can see the hinge has changed completely. And as you move it forward like that, see, it's a lot less complex. Now, it's not the easiest to see, thing to see, but there are still some wires visible on that front edge. Most of the time, it's pretty hard to catch a view of those, but if you, if you peek and you take a look, there's a couple of wires right inside this area in here. But not the whole messy conglomeration of stuff that we saw with the Duo 11. We have ventilation over here. These are not the speakers. More ventilation out the back, and all your parts are at the back. Tidy people will love this. Everything is in one place, and the cords are never going to bump into your left hand or your right hand when you're using the mouse, anything like that. Of course, you do have to look around and reach behind the machine to find ports, so it's up to you as to whether you like that or not. But you can see we have two USB 3.0 ports, and one offers charging. There's our headphone combo mic jack, 3.5 millimeter. Charging port, this uses the same compact charger as the Vio Pro line, and it has a built-in USB port to charge your smartphone, tablet, whatever you have that's USB. Full-size HDMI right here. And then we have our combo card slot, SD, MMC, and of course, memory stick, Sony's favorite right there. And this little notch up top, if you have an overseas, not US model, it's available with 3G, 4G option. Uh, we don't have that here, and there's a blank covering the hole right there, but that's where it would be. So this model does not have 3G, 4G, does not have a GPS inside. Nothing really going on on the sides, except for we have our power button over here, small enough so you won't accidentally press it. You can see the bevel here. Sony's pretty clever. They make this thing look pretty darn slim when it's closed, because what you're going to notice first is the far extremities, and this is a very thin line. It makes it look really sleek. It's about 0.71 inches at the back, and it tapers down much thinner at the front here, around a third of an inch at the front, but obviously it cuts down more to allow room for the motherboard. More ventilation over here. If we take a look at the back, you can see we have rubber feet, very grippy. NFC area right here, really obviously more easy to use if you're using it in tablet mode than if you're using it as a desktop or laptop. 8 megapixel camera on the back. We have a 2 megapixel camera up front, so that's better than average imaging that, that you're getting there. And it actually takes reasonably decent pictures. Not as good as some of the best 8 megapixel camera phones we've seen, including some from Sony, but pretty good job. Here is the speaker grill. Now there's a, there is a slope right here, a taper, so that this is not right against the desk, this area, so it doesn't mute itself. And right there we have the 
Oddly placed volume controls and the assist button. The assist button brings up recovery and everything that you might need, driver help, all that sort of stuff. It's really there for when you're using it in tablet mode. Otherwise, on the keyboard, you also have control of your volume keys and you can access assist via an icon on screen. On this side here, here's something interesting. This is a little removable piece of plastic that comes in the box, and that's the clip for your pen. This has an N-Trig digitizer. It works much like a Wacom digitizer. That's an active digitizer, and you can actually clip the pen into here for carrying it around. That might get bumped off, but it's better than nothing, and it's fairly secure. This, by the way, is longer than the Duo 11 pen, just a little bit. About from here on is increased in length. Makes it feel a little bit nicer, more pen-like. This is a metal body pen, quite nice, and it uses a quadruple A battery inside that they say could last up to a year and a half. In my experience, it depends how much you use it. If you use it a lot, it might be every six months. You have to replace that battery. Also on the side is a little pop-out, and that's the inkwell holder. So you can just stick the pen in there when you're using it in convertible open mode. So you've got a place to put it so you're not going to say, oh gosh, where did I leave that on the table? At least there's some place to keep it tidy and handy when you're using it. Up front here we have a mechanical clicky home key, not capacitive, so you won't accidentally press it. Webcam's up there. Ambient light sensor is there as well. And we have our full HD, as HD as Sony calls it, triluminous display. Really lovely display. For those of you wondering if this is the same panel as in the Sony Vio Pro 13, yes it is. It specs out exactly the same. Very good color gamut. Got 96% of sRGB color gamut and 73% of Adobe RGB, and that's within one point of what we saw on the Duo, as rather on the Pro 13. About the same brightness, we got 250 nits of brightness on the Pro 13, and this one managed 255 nits of brightness. So adequately bright, not super duper bright. Really lovely colors, obviously, and fairly accurate, too. With our spider calibration, it didn't have to change the calibration much to achieve better color accuracy. So one of the nicest displays you can get, it is an IPS panel. You can see the viewing angles stay very good, other than the fact we're going to pick up a little glare. And by the way, as glare goes, this controls glare pretty well. Compared to a lot of laptops we've reviewed with glossy touchscreens, it's not not too horrible. It doesn't, has not driven me crazy. 10 points of capacitive multi-touch right here, too. Works just fine, quite responsive, and obviously works with that included digital pen as well. Contrast is quite high, around 900 to 1, just like with our Pro 13 again, and black levels are also very good, so really lovely for watching movies on this, and certainly for those who are are involved in the graphic arts. It's going to be fairly color accurate and fairly pleasing, something good to work with. You can see the feet on the bottom there. They stick up a little bit right on the back end there. Puts a little bit of a better angle to use it, so that's kind of a nice concession to usability right there. Also a lot easier to open. Some people had trouble with the Duo 11 opening it. I didn't have too much trouble, but you can see just pretty much one touch lift. There it is, goes in. If you want to push it, you can get it clicked onto those feet. That's about all there is to it. Here we have a cut down groove on each side to sink the keyboard down so that it doesn't touch against the back of the machine when it's closed. And it gives you a fairly comfortable typing area. And now we have itsy bitsy area of a little wrist rest place to put your hands, which is nice. And the big change, notice you got a trackpad here. It even supports multi-touch, so it's awfully teeny. I don't know how super involved you want to get with doing multi-touch. But it works fine. After We got driver updates right out of the box from uh, Sony's update service. and absolutely no complaints with the way it works and even though it's small I find it's pretty handy for those times when you're working with small targets like on the desktop here when touching something might be a little hard and right now we're running at 100% scaling we don't have any zoom going on so the targets can be pretty small keyboard has fairly good relief really much improved over the Duo 11 in general it, just in terms of the size because this is 13.3 inches so they've got a lot more room to work with and they've taken advantage of that a little bit better than they did with the Duo 11 as well so reasonable key high here, but honestly, it still feels a little flat when you're typing on it. I have no trouble typing accurately on this. I was able to write a review. But the thing is that after a while, for those of you who are sensitive to that, you just feel like you're hitting against something hard. So you might feel a little finger or wrist fatigue on it. But in terms of actually being able to be productive on it, good job. Obviously, we have the silver model here, and unlike the Samsung Series 7 Ultra, now called the Ativebook 7, which also had a silver keyboard, 
the contrast with the letters is quite good here. So I never found like I had trouble seeing them when the backlight wasn't on. In fact, in some cases with the Samsung, the backlight could actually make things worse. So yes, it's visible. Obviously, the carbon black, you'd have even more contrast because you'd have white lettering on the keys. And this is a backlit keyboard that works off the ambient light sensor. You can control the duration of the backlighting, but you can't control the intensity. The ambient light sensor handles that. And the backlighting on this is not super even. I don't know if this is just our particular unit or if that's just par for the course for this. And we'll show you how it looks in the dark so you can see for yourself. Compared to my Vio Pro 13, which has super even backlighting, I was a little bit bummed. It's still very usable, but some areas are just brighter than others. And here's what the keyboard backlighting looks like in the dark. And you can see it's not quite so even. Right here, these keys are just not really as bright. And it's really super bright right over here. The 9 is bright. The 8 is not as bright. Hmm. I mean, you can see it all, and it works just fine. But it's not as perfectly even as my Vio Pro 13 is. In terms of configurations and pricing, the base model is $1399. With that, you get a Core i5 4200U, 1.6 gigahertz. And that comes with Intel HD 4400 graphics, 4 gigs of RAM, and 128 gig SSD. What we have is kind of a middle build to order version right here. Fry's is actually carrying this for those of you who have Fry's Electronics near you. And this is the Core i7 4500U, that's 1.8 gigahertz, still with the Intel HD 4400 graphics, 8 gigs of RAM, and that's set up dual channel, and 128 gig SSD, that's 1619. And then there is the top of the line model. You can get the i7 with the 4650U, 1.7 gigahertz, and Intel HD 5000 graphics for a little more graphics boost. And that's pretty nice, but you're looking at oh, over 2200 bucks right there to buy that model. And then there's an 1899 model, which is the Core i7 Intel HD 4400, 8 gigs of RAM, and a 256 gig SSD. If you want, you can even get a 512 gig SSD with this guy. You can get it with Windows 8 64-bit, or you can get it with the Pro version if you need that. Of course, you can also upgrade it yourself afterwards if you want. Memory on this is soldered on board. You cannot upgrade it yourself. The, the SSD drive, in theory, you should be able to. It's not been so easy to take apart duos, but I'm sure that some adventurous folks will find a way to get the bottom plate off of this and access the internals to do so. You can see our Windows Experience Index here. It's pretty good, 7.1 for processor. RAM is 7.6 dual channel, so we get higher numbers, better than that 5.9 we often see for single channel RAM. 5.9 for graphics for desktop, that's unusually high. Often 5.4 5.4 or 5.5 is about as good as you're going to get with Intel HD 4400 graphics. 3D graphics, 6.5, also very nice. And the SSD scores 7.5. Seven hours is a Samsung SSD module in there. Often we see 8.1 for an SSD. I'm surprised it's not a little bit higher, but that's not too bad. Our benchmark scores have been quite good with PC Mark 7. It scored a 4800 even. Now, Haswell, for those of you who are new to this whole thing, Haswell's Intel's fourth generation core CPU. Uh, and we haven't seen a whole lot of performance improvements there. If you're looking at the Intel HD 5000 version, you get a little bit of tweak on the graphics, but not much. So it's about the same as Ivy Bridge. The, the big selling point here really is the increased battery life. But 4800 is a pretty respectable number for our Core i7 1.8 gigahertz model with Intel HD 4400 graphics. On 3D Mark 11, it scored a 1072, 1072 on performance. I would love to know how Sony is doing that because that's just really high. There aren't a lot of Intel Haswell ULV Ultrabook machines out there yet, but compared to 636 for the Vio Pro 13, wow, that's just wickedly improved. They both have the same Intel HD 4400 graphics, so nice, not bad at all. We're not talking dedicated graphics level here, but it's always nice to have, especially if you're something that does have a digital pen, and some of you may want to actually use this with art apps and things that are more graphically demanding. Speaking of which, I've actually been playing Civ 5 and really enjoying it, and frame rates have been quite good on it. Better again than I've noticed on the Pro 13. Also, it runs a little cooler and quieter. Now, the Pro 13 has an overzealous fan. This guy is kind of more mellow. This one waits to be up about 48 degrees centigrade. So here we are in Civ 5, so you can see how it runs. And this game has been, oh, running for about an hour and a half now, so it's pretty far along, fairly complex layout right here. And you can see that Fraps is showing us 30 frames per second. I've seen it as high as actually 44, which is really kind of hard to believe. We're running it at 1920 by 1080 setting, 60 hertz, so that's pretty darn nice. And we have it in the touch UI mode, so...
Certainly looks beautiful enough. Frame rate holds up even when we zoom out and turns are pretty quick too. You can hear the sounds actually quite nice on it too. And the nice thing is the fan is not roaring right now. And even if we pull, unplug the power adapter, which we're running, usually with games you want the best possible performance, so you want to run it plugged in, it's still going to hold up decently for those of you who want to play on the go and you don't have access to power. So just unplug the charger. And it's still holding up just fine. Turns to, don't take too long. It's pretty reasonable. All in all, it's really a pleasure. And the fact that it doesn't get ro roaringly loud with the fan, it will get warm at the bottom part. But, you know, don't put this directly on your lap when you're playing 3D games, that's for sure. But other than that, it's a good experience. So there's Civ 5 on the Sony Vio Duo 13 with the Core i7 and Intel HD 4400 integrated graphics. And this is what the charger looks like, small, compact, again, same one as you get with the Vio Pro, and there's your USB for charging, your smartphone, or your tablet, or whatever you have, whatever you have that's USB-based. And now, for those of you who aren't sure if you want a conventional notebook with a touchscreen or a convertible designer, considering both the Pro 13 and the Duo 13, here they are together. And you can see at the front edge, they're both equally thin, but our Duo 13 does get a little thicker on the back. Now this guy weighs a lot less. This is under two and a half pounds versus 2.93 pounds, but honestly, they're still both very light. Just really depends on which design you want. They both have the same excellent 13.3 inch full HD display, but the pen input is only an option for your Duo 13. That's included with the Duo 13. There is no pen input on a conventional notebook design like this, which makes sense. It's not really very easy to write on the screen when you're only using it in notebook mode. And now we have it with the Lenovo ThinkPad Helix over here, 11.6 inch tablet, actually separable from its keyboard dock, has a Wacom pen, so also good for those of you who need pen input. And the ThinkPad is pretty much uniformly thick, and it's just slightly thinner than the thickest point of the Sony, but it's thicker at the front since it's uniformly thick. And the difference in size, well, this is 11.6 inch, so let's put it right on this Gorilla Glass display here. We're not too worried. And you can see the difference in size between the 11.6 inch and the 13.3 inch right there. The Duo 13 has NFC, Bluetooth 4.0, and dual band Wi-Fi 802.11bgn. This, in this case, this is Broadcom Wi-Fi and not the Intel Wi-Fi that we saw on the Vio Pro 13. Interesting that they're using different things. Now, the Broadcom has just been working just fine out of the box, and I've had no range problems. I know some of you had problems with the Duo 11, I actually didn't have too much of a problem, but even walking 30 feet away from our 802.11n router, I managed to get the same bandwidth download that I did standing 3 feet away from it, which is the maximum rating of our connection, 25 megs down, 25 megs up. Worked just fine, works reliably, doesn't drop out. I like it, it's fine. Now how about battery life? You know, this guy might be a little thicker than the, the, the Vio Pro, but still it's pretty thin. Somehow Sony managed to really increase battery life. The, the Vio Duo 11 didn't have the greatest battery life, about four and a half hours. Well, Haswell has a lot to, to do with actually helping it have improved battery life. And beyond that, they've also significantly increased the capacity of the battery. So inside here we have a 6,320 milliamp per hour battery inside. It's insane. This thing, Sony claims up to 10 hours of use time, and I've been easily getting 9 hours, and I keep the brightness at at least 50% since it's not a wildly bright display with Wi-Fi on and active at all times, and that's with some streaming video going on, doing MS Office work, and doing a whole lot of drawing and painting, and a little bit of note-taking too. So yeah, this guy is just an Energizer bunny. It pretty much is an all work day long product. And that's screen on time. I don't mean I'm using it for a while, then I let it go to sleep. I mean actual nine hours of usage time. Sony Bundles Art Rage Studio Pro 3.5 with this. We've tested that out, and I've also put my own Art Rage 4.0 copy on here, and we'll see how it does. One thing I've noticed, I don't know if this is just something going on with our unit, or if this is a bug right now, but the pencil tool is too light and faint. 
You can just barely see that. I've depressed pretty hard, and I have adjusted the pressure curve for the pencil to make it very heavy compared to with my finger. You can see how heavy that is. But other tools like the paintbrush are handled much better. I don't have it set to be very thick right now, so that's fine. And the airbrush is likewise not too bad. You see it's pretty usable. It's acting airbrushy, but it's a little on the light side compared to that to finger input, which is very heavy. But anyway, it certainly gets the job done other than if you want the pencil tool, at least for our model right here, and one can draw with it just fine. And here's a drawing that's a little bit further along, and I'm using the ink pen since I can't really use the pencil right now. And that's working fairly well. Now, it's very accurate. There's no pen offset. That's something that's very nice. It also works right out to the edges of the screen. We bumped it up to full screen so you can see just how close to the edges I can get and it's still staying very accurate. Now that's something that's that's very much in favor of Intrigue versus Wacom because we know that Wacom pens have had trouble lately with edge accuracy and edge detection. I can just scribble my way to heaven right here on the edges of this screen. No problem whatsoever. The drawback with Intrigue is there's no WinTab drivers for Adobe Photoshop and Corel Painter and SA Paint Tool for those of you who use those. Now, before you blame Intrigue, they make their APIs available, and it's actually up to Adobe to develop those, and they've been trying for years to do that, and they have something that's early but not good enough still to send out to users to beta test. So my guess is we can keep on waiting for this, and probably Adobe's going to finally switch over to the Windows API for pressure sensitivity before they actually have drivers ready for this for WinTab, but we'll see. It's still a possibility. Now, for other applications that use the modern WinTab API like ArtRage, you do get Photoshop right out of the box. And then there's a couple of other applications too. Sony includes their Note Anywhere, and in fact, or Note Anytime. And in fact, this can open up whenever you pull the pen out of the little holder on the side if you like. That's a settable option, sort of like the Galaxy Tab. So here it is, a Note application, and nice and smooth, and pen works great there. Pressure, no problem with it at all being too faint and light. So built-in note-taking application comes with it. And if we go back to our desktop, we're going to take a look at OneNote next. And it works just fine. We have no problem with it. Tracking circles, all that kind of thing. Handwriting is pretty darn terrible, but let's see if we can try to convert that. Almost. Hello, how are you? But it's pretty close. Works well, very quick, very smooth operation. So also good for you note takers, those of you who need to draw diagrams, equations, all that kind of stuff. Good times. Sony bundles a bunch of apps on here. Most of these are live tile apps. Some of them are even shortcuts just to internet services. Of course, we have their own music player, which isn't a bad music player, so I'm not going to complain about that. Access to their services, their, their streaming video and music kind of stuff. But I actually like to have cam scanner here, you can kind of use this as a scanner and you can snap pictures of text pages and use some OCR and them get stuff done. And we have ArcSoft Camera for VIA, which is better than the built-in Microsoft Camera application in terms of both image quality that you're going to get and features. So no complaints there whatsoever. They have Slacker Radio here, they have a couple of little games, Evernote Touch is preloaded. As always, anything you don't want, just get rid of it. That's not a problem. Not too much really in the way of heavy-duty bloatware on this. They have their own update tool, which of course I really recommend that you keep, and BioCare will help you do recovery and all that sort of stuff. And this is what Sony's music player looks like. A little jazzier than Xbox music player, though Xbox music player will improve with Windows 8.1 release. And that's what it looks like. And our volume is at 76% right now. Not wildly loud, but pleasing sound. Not distorted, not hissy, not too tinny, as something that's 13 inches goes anyway. Not bad at all. And certainly good enough for watching a movie yourself if you don't want to use headphones, or speakers, or Bluetooth speakers. And now we'll test out video playback and we'll use one of our own video reviews to see how that goes. 
and we're using the Metro version of IE right now. As ever, you get two versions with Windows 8. And we'll bring that up to a full 1080p. This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and today finally we're going to look at the Lenovo we'll screen it. Pad Helix. This is a Windows convertible, as you Absolutely can see here, fine. two pieces, keyboard dock, but this feels an awful lot like a real notebook when you dock it together. Really, it's just a wonderful experience to actually watch movies on this. High quality, really nice colors, great contrast levels. It's great for media consumption. So that's the Sony VAIO Duo 13. It's available now. A little bit hard to find in stores, but I'm sure it'll start popping up more places soon. Uh, it's certainly a very compelling convertible tablet and one of the first with Haswell. But besides that, we have to say we like it a lot. Awesome display. Usable keyboard. Much improved there. Really quiet, really fast. Not bad. It might be a little pricey, but at least you're getting some good for your money. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full review of the Duo 13 and subscribe to our YouTube channel too.